One Up Media. Minamata disease was first reported in May 1956 in Minamata City, Japan. The methamercury entered the food chain, poisoning the fish and shellfish. People who ate the fish and shellfish unknowingly ingested the methamercury, which then destroyed their brain cells, causing severe illness. The discovery of Minamata disease started when a group of local fishermen stumbled upon a troubling sight. The wastewater pipes from the Chiso Corporation dumping their contents directly into the ocean. Around this discharge site, their eyes were drawn to a haunting sight, a distressing amount of dead fish ominously floating on the water surface. Alarmed by this unsettling occurrence, the fishermen promptly alerted scientists to delve deeper into the matter. The scientists, on analyzing the situation, then embarked on a quest to gather evidence. They discovered that the seafood caught in Minamata Bay contained dangerous levels of methyl mercury, a toxic compound notorious for its detrimental impact on neurological development. For the thousands of people who relied on the ocean for their livelihood, these contaminated fish were the cause of the severe poisoning. And the source of this toxic contamination? It traced back to the chemical waste carelessly discharged by the Chiso Corporation. In 1957, Dr. Hajime Hosokawa, a Chiso employee and conscientious medical doctor, conducted a groundbreaking experiment. Testing the wastewater from Chiso's pipes on cats, he noticed signs of convulsions, erratic movements, and uncontrolled behavior, similar to the troubling symptoms plaguing the residents. In partnership with scientists from Kumamoto University, they linked the mercury ingestion from the fish of Minamata Bay to the onset of the illness, unequivocally implicating Chiso as the source of the mercury poisoning. However, confronting Chiso, the biggest employer of Minamata Bay, posed a colossal challenge. At the time, Chiso offered employment to over 5,000 locals and enjoyed a shield of political protection from the government's vested interests. Exposing a corporation of such magnitude was an enormous undertaking. Any allegations made were taken very seriously, and whoever dared to raise concerns often faced significant consequences. For the people of Minamata, Chiso provided the means of their livelihoods, while for politicians, they didn't dare to bite the hand that feeds them. I am the only person here who can still walk. When I think about the feeling of others who can't, it makes me think that if Chiso had stopped dumping mercury earlier, none of this would have happened. From One Up Media, this is Mass Murders. During October 2021, the United Nations convened a conference marking the 50th anniversary of the Minamata disease, commemorating one of Japan's most severe pollution crises of the 20th century. Masami Ogara, a Minamata disease survivor, was invited to address the audience at this significant event. In September 1957, when I was nearly two years old, my grandfather, Fukumatsu Ogara, suddenly developed an unexplained illness, which worsened day by day with convulsions and drooling, difficulty walking, speech problems, and other symptoms. Two months later, he passed away in the isolation and infectious diseases ward at the Minamata City Hospital. That was the first tragedy caused by Minamata disease in the Ogata family. However, we were never told what caused the illness. My sister Hitomi, who was born a week before her grandfather developed the illness, was born with a disability, again without explanation. Then, other members of the Ogata family started falling ill, one after another. 
Understanding why people hesitated to expose the Chiso Corporation is crucial. Confronting such a powerful entity involved numerous complexities and risks, making it a daunting prospect. This challenge was magnified in the context of a small town like Minamata, where the odds were even more stacked against those attempting to speak out. Firstly, ever since the Meiji Restoration in 1867, Japan embarked on a period of rapid modernization. This era instilled in its people the idea that industrial progress and personal sacrifices were crucial for Japan's survival against Western industrial powers. This period shifted the perspective. People were now viewed more as obligated subjects rather than citizens with rights. Then came World War II, which inflicted profound and unimaginable damage upon Japan. The city of Hiroshima lies prostrate after the withering blast which wiped out 53,000 of its population. Four square miles of buildings leveled by the first of two small bombs that decided the fate of Japan. The explosion was concentrated within one square mile, making the devastation even more complete. After the war, the Japanese government received significant contributions from the Chiso Corporation, aiming to aid in post-war relief and the country's recovery. Using these funds, the local government established schools and hospitals. But unfortunately, amid Japan's push for modernization, traditional roles like those of the Minamata fishermen were seen as outdated, aligning with the nation's efforts to transition to more modern occupations and industries. The perception of the Chiso Corporation, however, couldn't be more different. It was lauded by both politicians and the media as a symbol of post-war national progress. Secondly, in Japanese culture, the term for pollution roughly translates to the words public nuisance, signifying something that disrupts communal harmony. Pollution, as perceived, could pose both social and physical threats. It might challenge the established social norms or directly endanger the community's well-being. Consequently, individuals who raised concerns about pollution and sought justice were sometimes viewed as polluters themselves. Dr. Hajime Hosokawa, the individual who initially linked mercury poisoning to the Chiso chemical plant, encountered significant obstacles from the corporation, demanding that he cease his investigation. In response to Dr. Hosokawa, Chiso staunchly refuted allegations of being the contamination source. No surprise there. In 1959, the Japan Chemical Industry Association released a report dismissing any connection between the disease and mercury. And furthermore, the Japanese Ministry of International Trade and Industry, focused on industrial growth rather than environmental concerns, halted all ongoing government studies on the disease in Minamata. The victims encountered a multitude of hurdles that extended far beyond the physical impact of the illness. Alongside battling the severe health effects, they confronted social ostracization and economic ruin. The stigma attached to the disease inflicted profound isolation, while the contamination of the waters wreaked havoc on the fishing community's livelihood. Amid the pervasive silence surrounding issues of pollution and profound suffering during the 1950s, their anguish was exacerbated, rendering them marginalized and bereft of a voice. In 1959, the Chiso Corporation quietly offered a sum of money as compensation to the fishermen, keeping it as a secret. However, upon learning of this inadequate compensation, over 4,000 furious fishermen gathered to confront Chiso's management. They were deeply dissatisfied with the meager sympathy payments meant to make amends for the water contamination caused by the company. As a result, they rejected these payments and stormed the factory compound, threatening the company's operations. It was a final desperate attempt by the fishermen to voice their grievances, but it ended up achieving very little. Instead, it jeopardized the jobs of thousands of employees, backfiring on them. Local politicians favoring Chiso and condemning the fishermen 
were primarily concerned about potential job cuts and reduced taxes if Chiso's operations were altered. This fear stemmed from the understanding that lower taxes often translate to limited revenue for politicians to invest in public services and development. Chizo employees and their families also sided with the company, condemning the fishermen. Even local labor unions held a press conference to oppose those speaking up against the company. As word about the allegations spread, the residents of Minamata treated the fishermen poorly. Shop owners refused to serve them, and if they did, they made them leave their money on the floor, only to pick it up with chopsticks. News of the controversy had also wreaked havoc on the fishing industry in Minamata. But surprisingly, while backing Chiso's claim that there was no pollution issue, the governor of Minamata passed a law that prohibited the sale of fish from the bay. Until that moment, it seemed that the victims of Minamata disease had experienced a crushing defeat. During the 1960s economic boom in Japan, there was a strong desire to embrace prosperity after the difficult post-war era. Seafood started to gain a notable cultural significance, not just as food, but as a symbol of Japanese identity. Across wet markets nationwide, the abundant variety of fish and shellfish on display proudly represented prosperity. The fishermen of Minamata Bay capitalized on this cultural significance by staging an attention-grabbing protest. In July 1973, they dumped five tons of fresh sardines at the Chiso Corporation's main gate to protest the contamination of Minamata by the company. These actions aimed to demonstrate to Japanese consumers the direct impact of Minamata Bay's pollution on them. The victims understood that the system wouldn't take any action unless they forced it to do so. Teruo Kuwamoto, born in 1931 to a fishing family, was a key figure in the Minamata activism. He directly witnessed the impact of Minamata disease as his father was severely affected by it. By the time he was 26, he also endured mild symptoms of the disease, including partial paralysis of his limbs and stiffness in his tongue. Devoted to finding and registering victims, he orchestrated sit-ins, campaigned outside Chiso's headquarters, and worked with journalists and activists to raise awareness. Despite some of the Minamata victims winning their case against Chiso in 1973, Kuwamoto remained unswayed. He persisted in seeking an audience with the Chiso president, demanding a direct public apology rather than settling for a financial compensation. In August of 1973, Kuwamoto and his group eventually met President Shimada of Chiso, and it was what happened during the meeting that changed everything. Kuwamoto's voice echoed in the tense room, carrying the weight of unspoken pain and unresolved anguish. <laughs> President Shimada, dressed in a suit, sat composed, but his eyes betrayed a hint of uncertainty. What we really wish to see, Kuwamoto said, is the responsible people of the company becoming sensitized to those pains and sufferings of trees, fish, sea, and mountains, as well as us humans. President Shimada, do you pray? He asked. I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. What I mean to say is, are you religious, President? Shimada, taken aback by the directness of the question, shifted in his seat. Yes, I do, he began, choosing his words with care. <clears throat> I have a space, a place of reflection for myself, and in it, I have a shrine on which the names of the Minamata victims are inscribed. Kuwamoto's eyes remained fixed, an unwavering gaze that seemed to seek answers beyond the man sitting across from him. Shimada's expression then shifted, a subtle acknowledgement of the weight of responsibility. Look, we want to help, he said. But the scale of what you ask for, it's too much for the company to bear. 
We can't. Suddenly, a victim leapt from his seat, trembling uncontrollably. I can't stand this anymore. You can see it for yourself. If I don't get the indemnity money, I can't live. The victim shattered a glass ashtray on the table and used its shards to cut his wrists, blood spurting out in a shocking display. Stunned into speechlessness, the president muttered in disbelief, Yes, 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 we will pay. We will pay. The chemical came from wastewater dumped by the Chiso Corporation in Minamata Bay in Kumamoto Prefecture. It's considered the first sickness caused by environment. The pollution. Chiso Corporation agreed to a compensation package of around $60,000, plus medical expenses for all victims, extending beyond those who had sued. Chiso also compensated fishermen nationwide, affected by the plummeting demand for their catch due to the controversy. The financial burden became so heavy that the Japanese government had to intervene and bail out Chiso in 1978 to ensure ongoing compensation for the victims and secure the town's main source of employment. This struggle transformed the political landscape, pushing for a balance between economic growth and environmental protection. In a landmark ruling in March 1979, Japanese courts handed a two-year prison sentence to two Chiso executives in the first-of-its-kind criminal conviction for pollution. Over the following decades, ongoing compensations and legal actions persisted against Chiso. It was reported that the total costs, including compensation and cleanup of Minamata Bay, ballooned to nearly $2 billion. Till today, the enduring impact of the tragedy lingers on, affecting generations of residents who suffered from the mercury poisoning. As of the latest data in 2013, residents in Minamata continue to grapple with the medical repercussions. The Japanese Ministry for Environment disclosed that nearly 3,000 individuals had been certified as victims of Minamata disease, with over 2,300 reported deaths. However, Researchers argue that this figure might be underestimated, suggesting that tens of thousands in the region had showed neurological symptoms consistent with methylmercury poisoning. The Minamata Convention on Mercury, signed on October 10, 2013, stands as a pivotal stride in protecting human health and the environment from mercury's detrimental effects. The convention forbids the establishment of new mercury mines, gradually eliminates existing ones, reduces and stops mercury use in different products, and imposes rigorous control over mercury emissions into the air, land, and water. Now we go back to Masami Ogata's speech in October 2021, delivered during the United Nations Assembly, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Minamata disease. When I became an adult, I noticed that I had very little sensation in my limbs. I worked as a joiner, and when I was younger, I would often cut my finger on the whetstone when sharpening knives, because my finger would droop. We came to understand that it was caused by methylmercury poisoning. But we couldn't really make it public that we were victims, because people thought that Minamata disease was contagious. Rumors spread though, and people would say that no one should marry a member of the Ogata family. I got married at the age of 20, but on the day of our engagement, my wife had a phone call. Naming me, the person said to her, the man you are trying to marry is a Minamata disease victim. The whole family will be annihilated. Are you okay to go to such a place as a bride? I hid my disease from others. I would change the subject if it came up and say that it had nothing to do with me. It was my daughter who said to me that I had to live honestly. Her words struck in my chest, and I chose to stop hiding. For 10 years, my application to be officially declared a Minamata disease victim was rejected. Until on March 15, 2007, the governor of Kumamoto Prefecture declared that she would recognize me as a Minamata disease patient. 
After receiving the certification, I asked myself how I would live in the future. Then I decided to become a storyteller, so I could tell people all over the world about the disease. Murders is a one-up media original. A quick word on our reenactments and dramatizations. While we can't know exactly what they say, think, or feel at the moment, it is all based on research. This episode was executive produced by Guang Jin, produced and written by Ethan Sam, edited by Alex, narrated by Jason, audio experience by Ethan Sam, with additional engineering by Ashley from One Up Media. Thank you for listening. We'll see you in the next one. 